Well, welcome in the precious and glorious name of Jesus to the Ignited Mentoring Series. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, I want to share with you four steps or keys to help you come in and make the secret place of His presence your abiding place. And I'm going to share insight from John G. Lake. Now, understand that the secret place is the place where we are to come and experience that intimacy of holy fellowship with the Lord. Jesus, when He is teaching the people and the disciples regarding prayer, explained that we were to come into the secret place and meet with the Father. We are also told in the book of Hebrews that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Where do we diligently seek Him? Where do we meet Him in the secret place of His presence? Where are we to come and make it permanent? Residence is the secret place of His presence. That's the place where you are changed. That's the place where you enter Him to all of the blessings He provided through what He did on the cross. Many people um, get a hold of Jesus as Lord and Savior but they never fully experience all that God has because they never press in to the secret place and there you know, dwell permanently. They come and they visit. They have an experience. They buy the t-shirt, as I say, and then they leave. But you're not meant to come and leave. This is where you abide. And if we learn how to abide here, your life will be changed. You will become more like Him you will begin to walk in an effective prayer life and be effective spiritually. You're going to grow up. So it's essential we understand, how can I come in? I pray that you're hungry. I pray that you just, God, I'm so desiring to know you. Because it's not just, God, that I want you. I want to know you and be known by you. To have a living, intimate, holy relationship. Because that's what God wants. It is not just where He is a distant God, but rather He's called us to draw nigh to Him, and He will draw nigh to us, that we might know Him, that we can experience what John explained regarding the disciples, that that which we've touched and felt and seen, we make known to you. Jesus wants you to come into that secret place and there touch, feel, and know, and have an experience, an encounter, and there be forever changed. So I pray you're ready. Let's pray and let's press in to receive all He has for us today. And so, Father, we do come in the name, above all names, the name of Jesus. We are gathering in that name. Father, there's no distance in the Spirit. And we just welcome you, Holy Spirit, right now as we gather in the name of Jesus to come and meet with us, minister to each person, give eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart. Open the Word and bring forth such rich, vibrant revelation of Jesus in what He did on the cross and who we are as a consequence. And Father, I just pray that not one person leaves the same. And in all of this, Jesus, you be lifted up. I thank you for the anointing. I thank you for the presence, Father. In the name, above all names, the name of Jesus, we pray. You know, I look at Jesus and how could He walk with such bold confidence, and preach as one having authority because of this relationship he had with the Father. We look at Jesus and how effective he was in life and ministry, and it came out of his vibrant, rich, deep prayer life where he got into the secret place and had a constant fellowship with the Father. If we go to Psalm 91, verse 1, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I encourage you to read the rest of the psalm and see all of the blessings afforded (coughs) to those who make the secret place their permanent residence. And that's what it's talking about. It's not just coming and visiting, but this is where you build your roots. This is where you take your life and you say, I am forming roots, I am not moving. And we become like those who dwell in the secret place. We take on the culture. We assimilate into that place. 
We want to be changed so that as He is, so too are we. We identify with the secret place because where you live, you identify with and you become like. So we must become like those who dwell in the secret place. That is our citizenship. That's our inheritance. If I go to Matthew 6, the, the disciples and the people te teach us how to pray. And Jesus begins to give examples. And in verses 6 through 8, he says, but when you pray, he said, you go into the room. When you have shut your door, pray to the Father who is in the secret place. And the Father who sees in secret will reward in public. And then tells us we're not to be like the heathen, the Gentiles who pray these repetitious prayers. But see, our prayer life is to be real. We're not trying to force and wonder if there's something out there. But in this place of knowing, there's a difference when you meet somebody face to face and you have a real fellowship and you ask, you know that you've been heard and you know the answer. You know, I don't want to send a letter and wonder, did they get it? And what is their answer? And that's how most people, their prayer life is like. We've sent something way off there and we don't know if they ever received it. We don't know if they're going to answer it. But you were called into the secret place to meet with Him, to there love Him and be loved by Him, to have fellowship, to be able to ask and know. You should be so in tune with Him that you know when you pray, whether you're praying in align with His will. And you should be so touched that you never want to pray anything outside of His will. So how do we get there? Well, the first step is one of the most important things in your life. And that is we must always go through the finished work of the cross. Jesus explained, I believe, in John chapter 14, verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we must follow through Jesus. Jesus, the only way. And he went through the cross for us. The only way that you can ever enter is through the finished work of the cross. And I always want to underline that word finished. It was completed. Everything was done on the cross. When Jesus, at his, towards his last breath, said, it is finished, the veil was torn, the price was paid. The access was given. And we come and receiving that into our hearts. We are changed. And if we then go further in receiving that, there to come into His presence with a confidence, and so to know Him and abide there, because that is where we belong, we are going to be changed and we start to enter into what He provided for us through the finished work of the cross. John G. Lake said, Christ, the power of God, can change your life. He can make you a new creature, out of, make a new creation out of you, sorry. All things will pass away and all things become new. All things have passed away. That is the power of the cross. All things become new. That is the power of being raised in the newness of life in Him. See, most believers still continue to walk as the old sinner self, struggling to overcome it, which we see in Romans 7. But we're called to enter into Romans 8, where we now start to walk by the law of the spirit of life, not the law of sin and death, trying to make the old better. The old person must die on the cross. And we stand and receive the new life that is his. I have died and the new person who lives is no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. This life where I can enter in is wholly dependent on what He did. I can't earn this. I cannot, it's not through my works or anything that I can boast about. It is fully pointing to the cross. And because of the cross, you can come in and be changed and transformed. The struggle in trying to walk perfect, the struggle in trying to overcome wrong, bad behavior is defeated in the secret place where we receive who we are in Him and allow Him to do the work that only He can do. Where does He do? In the secret place. 
That's his workshop. That's his, you know, garage, or whatever you want to call it, where he works on you and brings you into. Now, listen to this. John G. Lake explained regarding the early church. It says, wherever they went, the Christians, early church, they were telling that the cross of the Nazarene is the center of religion. It is the secret of authority and government. It is the inspiration of true culture to the human life. Men laughed. They stumbled over it. Men were against it emotionally, morally, and intellectually. And the cross is a stumbling block for many. But the cross is the power of salvation for those who receive it. And we need a revelation. And we need, as you start to enter in, for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you fully what Jesus did on the cross and make it real to you personally so that you receive it and now understand who you are in Him. And then He wants to bring you into the place where you understand uh, what is yours as a consequence. We are heirs, co-heirs with Christ, co-workers, and we step into the authority and position, but it's all through the cross. The cross is the time that history was changed. Sadly today, you know, we've changed everything and we've lost sight of the fact that the cross changed the world. And we no longer talk about, you know, um, the way we record dates changed because we've lost sight of the cross. John G. Lake went on to say, men are still intellectually tripped by it. They revolt against it. The cross is still bearing a stigma. Now, people religiously interpret the cross and they put their thing on having a cross as if it has some magical power. No, it is what the cross means and it's the going through. It's the transformed life as a consequence that I recognize that's the place where I die. That's the place where I come to end because of what Jesus did. And I go through the cross with him. I am raised into new life with him. And in this new life, I'm a new creation. I walk no longer held captive to the old, but in the secret place, I am being brought into the new. Every day, taking new ground, every day being changed, every day becoming more like him, every day enjoying this rich fellowship because you become the company you keep. And because of the new creation nature, it is conducive for me to be transformed into his image. Because I've got that DNA in me. I am made like Him. I'm not the old sinner self, but I am a new creation. I've become alive spiritually. We were created for this fellowship. You know it. And there's a desire in us. There's this emptiness. And we're always longing for this fellowship. And we'll try all kinds of things to fill that void that only He can fill. That void that was created when man fell. And instead, they knew. See, when they heard the Lord come into the garden, they were stirred, knowing they needed it, but they couldn't because of sin. Because sin will always create a veil. Sin will always put a gap. That's why it's the cross. And if we blow it, if we miss it, we come back to the cross. We come back and plead the blood that Jesus shed, and we get washed, cleansed by what Jesus did on the cross. The cross is the center of this new life. Lake explained, Jesus of Nazareth did work in the world, shed his tears over mankind, labored in the spirit for their salvation, died on the cross, and shed his blood. But Jesus, my Lord, bless God, came forth out of the tomb, a living, glorified um, sovereign of over the earth and heaven, with all power and authority within his hand. Hallelujah. Jesus of Nazareth was the Lord in the days of his humiliation, but Jesus the Christ at the eternal throne is the divine manifestation of the overcoming God, the ultimate of all perfection, the final manifestation of all that God is God-like. Hallelujah. And we have to understand that Jesus came and the cross was him doing what only he could do, because no man can redeem the life of another. No person can set themselves free from sin. No person can lift himself out of an earthly uh, domain into a spiritual, because why we are dead spiritually. And being dead spiritually, I can't lift myself into that new life that I need to live. 
Jesus came and he did what only he could do and paid the price. And he will always be the center and the focus of all salvation. He will always stand there with the nail-pierced hands demonstrating, I paid the price. That not one person needs to go to hell, but those who've rejected him will have a day of accountability before him and they will see him as he truly is and recognize the full price he paid. But we can today on this earth come and know him, come and experience and have the impact of what he did on the cross impact our lives, change us here and now. Now is the time so that we come in to the secret place, not running from him, but submitting to him, coming to see his face, coming to have a relationship with him. Which leads me to the next point, which is we must receive Jesus, the living word. You know, when you look on this earth and you come before a court, you come and you build your case on case studies, on law, on principles. So you can say this is in the Constitution, for example, in America. I have a certain right. And so I come based on this and I'm arguing. So you have to put a foundation. I don't come based on my opinions. I remember being in court once and there was a person in front of me and the judge asked, are you guilty or not? And the person begins to explain their opinions. And the judge stopped him and said, I'm not interested in your opinions. Yes or no? Are you guilty or not? And he had to make his case, was he guilty or not, based on what the law said. Not his opinion of it, but based on the law. When we come into the secret place, we come based on the law that was met in Jesus. It's the law of the spirit of life. But there is a law, and the only way in is through the word. And this word must reign. Listen, Romans 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is the authority that the word is final authority. John G. Lake said, for the church of God and Christian faith to become strong and to be built up in God, it is necessary to get a foundation, a good foundation. It is a greater problem with most builders to get the old rubbish out of the way than to do the building. If we look at our own lives, we will observe this, that the things that have been rooted and grounded in our hearts, some traditions of the fathers, some of its misconception of the meaning of the word of God, much of our teaching is fragmented. These form the greatest obstacles to the engrafting of the living word of God. And we need to allow the word to truly be able to come into our lives and bear fruit because we're standing on the revealed word demonstrating and bring it into us the understanding of what Jesus did in the cross, of who we are and what is ours. God speaks and never adds to or violates his word. The word is forever settled in heaven and must be forever settled in our life. That's on what you stand. That's the foundation. That was what you argue your case on, not on how you feel, not on what somebody else says, not on whether you're, it's by the word. John G. Lake said, every one of us, who has, been, who has progressed in God, have a foundation, have found the difficulty was not in believing the word of God, but the difficulty was to get away from the things that were settled in our hearts as facts, though untrue. And that's one of the things that God has to do in us. We are told that we are to what? Abide in his word. If we're truly his disciples, we'll abide in his word. And we will come to know the truth, and the truth that we know will make us free. Because it begins to challenge those wrong thinkings, those wrong stuff in our lives that we've allowed in, accepted as the truth, though they were not. And God has to remove them so that we can come in and make the secret place our abiding place, so that we reside. We come under the shadow of the Almighty, under His full authority, so that what He says is true. We receive His laws. There is no rebelling against it. Because every time we push against it, well, I think this, we push ourselves up. We come and we humble ourselves to his word. Remember it says, if my people who are called by my name will first humble themselves, bow to the authority of him and his word. His word in John 15, 7, it says, if you abide in me, my words will abide in you. 
So if I abide in this secret place, the evidence, the proof is His Word abides in me. Because He's captured me, <clears throat> because He's everything to me, then what He says should be as well. I should treasure every word He speaks. You know, when you really fall in love with somebody, um, that person that you're in love with, you start to treasure what they say. You listen intently. You focus on. You're not absent, but you're listening to what they say because they mean something to you. And in the secret place, we come and we have to give our ears. That's why we need eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart. Because remember what we're told, um, the first command given to the children of Israel with promises, Hear, O Israel. They were to hear. They were to listen. The book of Hebrews, they were correct. Why? Because they didn't hear what the Spirit was saying. We're told to hear today what the Spirit is saying, and He speaks through the Word to us. Now, Lake then explained, if there is a question that is not clearly decided according to your vision in the common court of the gospel, then refer it to the Supreme Court, which is the words of Jesus, and the words of Jesus will settle anything that is in your mind. We always come before the Supreme Court of Heaven, and we submit to the authority of the Word. We submit to the Word, and when we're not sure, we come to the words of Jesus. We come to His words in the Word, and that Word is what forever settles it before the Supreme Court of Heaven. I come and I stand before the Lord our God, and I can stand on the authority of the Word. Why? Because, or sorry, the authority of the blood. Why? Because of the Word. I can say, I come through the cross. Well, what does that mean? Because of the Word. The Word brings the revelation, brings the authority, and it is forever settled. So if you want a judgment in your case, in your favor, it is based on the Word. Number three, we must choose the secret place to be our abiding place. It is not automatic. We must make the decision, like David said, this one thing I desire. Paul said, I press on. I have not arrived. And he explains, I'm desperate for this. There has to be something in us that we want this. Because throughout the day, there are so many things always buying for your attention. They want to capture the eyes, get the mind share, all these activities and other things that we can do. And when you come to pray, you'll find there's so many things that will try to distract you. Did I do this? Did I leave that on? And we have to make the decision that, God, I want you. And everything else has to be silenced. And, God, I need you. That this secret place relationship matters. I look at the life of Jesus, and I can't think of somebody more stretched thin. Uh, he has always been chased by the crowds. He's always been demanded of and he has no time to sleep or eat. And even while the time that he has you know, to sleep and rest is so small, he still got up early in the morning and sometimes prayed all night because this, the secret place, was critical. And he would not sacrifice this to make sure that his body was good. This was everything. Something else would give, but not the secret place. John J. Lake said, Beloved, God wants us to come to stay and to live in that abiding place, which is the Christian estate. That is the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. That is the secret place of the Most High. Bless God. This must be become my abiding place. If it's my abiding place, it defines me. You are known by, look at the life of Jesus. Every one of us, as we read the Gospels, understand that he had a rich, vibrant prayer life where he got alone and sought the Father, where he had a living relationship, fellowship with the Father, and he made it clear. And we, following the example of the Master, must be defined by, must be known by, this secret place relationship with Jesus. We are not a Christian because we turn up to a church. We're not a Christian because we know all the Christian things to say and to do. We're not a Christian because we're a member of a church or we were born into this denomination. We're a Christian because of an ongoing, now intimate fellowship with Jesus, a living relationship, a, de a deep intimacy of fellowship. See, many people have a distant relationship 
and it's a fragmented, distant relationship, and they are very weak as Christians. So it's not just a relationship, it's a holy fellowship. It's a humbling, it's an abiding in the secret place of seeking His face, where He becomes everything, and you are consumed by Him, and you pursue Him. You make the choice day after day, I want you. That is what a real relationship on this earth is like, where every day you have to make the choice to pursue it, to invest into it, to develop it. Um, in John 15, 4, where Jesus explains, if you abide in me, um, you must abide in me because he is the vine, we are the branches. That the vine is dependent, or sorry, the, 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 the branch is dependent upon that vine. That's where our life comes. We pull it out of the vine. So that life flows from the vine to us. And if we are severed from that vine, we die. So as a believer, Jesus is explaining, you must be abiding in that secret place, connected, plugged into the vine, which is him. Always dependent upon him. If we are out alone, we may survive for a day or two, but you start to wither. And many believers are in that place where they're withering and they're wondering why, because they're not abiding. They're not in this place. And it's a choice that we make every single day to come in and Jesus, you are my everything. You are my all in all. Oh, that I would so provoke you. You may have been yesterday so hungry and desperate for God that you thought, I don't know that anybody can be more hungry or desperate for me, for, for you, Jesus. Today, that's got to be even more. That's got to be even more. Which leads me to my next point, which is what we must be spiritually hungry. See, I choose it and I want it. I'm hungry for you, God. And God always satisfies our hunger. You have to be hungry. You have to come into the secret place desiring, seeking. I've made the choice. I want, you know why I come in here? Because I want you, Jesus. I need you. I'm hungering. I'm thirsting. I come by way of the finished work of the cross. I come standing on the authority of the word. I come because I want you. And I come because I need you. I'm hungering for you. I, I cannot go on without you. I can't face today without you. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. It is a spiritual law that God declared, if you hunger and thirst after Him, after His righteousness, you shall be satisfied. John G. Lake said, Hunger is a mighty good thing. It is a great persuader. There is a certain spirit of desperation that accompanies hunger. And when you are in that place where, God, if I don't get a hold of you, I go under, it will create desperation. When you're like the woman with the issue of blood and you understand that He is your source and your supply, that He is your answer, then you will do everything you can to get a hold of Him. Because remember we're told in the book of Hebrews, we must first believe that He is. He's what? He is your answer. He is your source. He is your supply. And He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I'm desperate for you, God. And I just truly pray that even right now in you, there is a desperation that, God, I need to know you. And it must continuously grow. John G. Lake went on to say, I see, on the other hand, that there must be a tremendous hunger, an overwhelming hunger, for the Lord's coming into the hearts of men, so that a prayer such as never was prayed in the world before Christ to come will arise to heaven. And out of this hunger, there must come a deep cry of your spirit, a deep crying out to the deep things of God. And when you're there, you know it. And I'm going to add this, that many of us stay in the zone where we're praying, but we've not entered into prayer. We're still in the formula mode where we're following this prayer formula that we've been taught. We have the form. I have, you know, my prayer list and I'm going through my list. I'm following the procedure I always follow. But no relationship is built upon a formula. If my relationship with you is every day I come with a list, then you are a, a, an employer and I'm an employee and I'm just coming based on this, okay, blah, blah, blah. There's no fellowship. 
There's no fellowship. We've had people that we have such a, a relationship with, but it's not even a real relationship. It is a connection for a purpose. And that's where most of us abide, where God wants you to come and God, I need you. I want you. So that what David explained, this one thing I desire, that I might abide, that I would seek, that I would stay in your secret place, that I might gaze upon your beauty, that I might know you. That place where I want this deepening, uh, growing relationship that consumes me day after day so that when I open the Word, God, that uh, you would meet with me here. And as I open the Word, you would share with me and I would get greater glimpses and understandings and revelations of you. And it would impact me. The Word would carry greater authority in me. There's a hunger. There's a hunger in me. Let me finish with this. John J. Lake said, God's purpose come to pass when your heart and mind get the real God cry. And the real prayer that God, sorry, let me read this again. God's purposes come to pass when your heart and mind gets the real God cry. And the real God prayer comes into our spirit. And the real God yearning gets our nature. Something is going to happen. And there's just a place where you know that you know. There's something in you cries out. There's something in you that's so desperate that you will not leave. You will not quit until you connect. You have to taste. You have to lay hold of. You have to receive. There's just a real hunger. This is not a passing, I wouldn't mind trying. This is I need. I need you, Jesus. Not thanks. See, most of us, again, our relationship with the Lord is based on things, things we need to live, things we need. This relationship recognizes my need is you, God. And it is so desperate that in my heart and mind, I know that without meeting with you, I can't live today and I can't face tomorrow. I need you. You are everything. You consume me. You overwhelm me. And there comes from the very core of every fiber of my being, a deep cry, crying out to the deep things of you, that I might meet with you, that I might know you, and so I come. Here I am in the secret place, and I pray that's where you're at, right? God, I'm here in the secret place for you. I'm seeking, I come, holy standing in what Jesus did on the cross. The finish, it was finished. Every decree against me nailed to the cross. I come pleading the blood of Jesus, because of the cross, redeemed because of the cross, given access to come into your presence because of what Jesus did. I stand before you as a son and a daughter because of Jesus and his mighty name through that finished work. It was all finished on the cross. How do I know by the authority of the word, Father? I just trust wholly on the authority of the word. My faith is in the word. My faith is I read the word and the spirit brought revelation of all my rights, of all that Jesus did, and I received that into my heart, and it became an authority. I stand there. And now, Father God, I choose you. I choose to come into the secret place. I choose to come boldly before your throne, and I declare I need you. I want you. And there's a deep cry in me, Father God, that only you can meet, only you can satisfy. I come this day. I come in that name. I come, Jesus, and I know that you will meet with me. I know that you will satisfy. I know that I come to drink of this water from the well. To, Father, that this whole being would just come a spring overflowing because of you, always increasing, always multiplying. God, I want to meet with you. Jesus, we honor you. Father, we just come into the secret place of your presence. I thank you, every life restored, every life lifted. Every life changed by you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just truly give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart, and teach us and show us how. Father, give us a deeper revelation of the finished work of the cross. Let it burn in us. Let it consume us so that it is real, living. Oh, Father God, open the word like never before so that our lives are built upon the word. That, Father, as we look at the word with revelation and understanding by the Spirit, we hear it, and as we hear it, Father God, because it's the voice speaking into our life with the authority, faith comes.
knowing that, Father God, you cannot, will not violate your word. You cannot, you watch over your word to perform it. And so we receive your word in our lives, knowing you will watch over it in our lives to perform it. So word, have the way. Jesus, you are the living word. Have your way in us. Do your mighty work through us. Oh, we just worship you, Jesus. We honor and thank you, Jesus. And I thank you, Father. This is our desire, you. We want you, so we come. We make the time available for you. We give you as much time as you need. We give you the place. We give you it to all, Jesus. We come and present ourselves before you. We choose you. We could do a lot of things, but Jesus, we choose you. We want you. And now, we declare we need you. We want every five of our being dissolved, consumed, found in you, till we've lost all identity to the old and we're found holy in you. I thank you, mighty Holy Spirit, for the work that you're doing. Move, come into the room. Come and move among each person. Touch them, convict them, provoke them, change them, challenge them, whatever it takes, and that Jesus be lifted up. Jesus, receive the honor, receive the worship, receive the praise. You are Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for everything you did on the cross. We just honor you. We lift you up. We enthrone you with our praise. Jesus, we just lift you up and enthrone you with our praise in the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Well, I pray this message has blessed you, and I just ask if it has, would you please like, share, subscribe, and give your comments. Because as you do, you truly help us to get more people, to reach more people through the algorithms. Uh, and I truly thank you for that. We want to reach as many people and bring them to a place of a deeper intimacy with Jesus. We're in the last days, and now more than ever, we need to see the backsliders coming back and enjoying the real intimacy. This is what we need. We need Jesus. We need more of Him. We need to abide in that secret place of His presence. We need to be revived there, refreshed there, restored, renewed there in the secret place. And I'm going to encourage you to check out the whole series. We're doing the whole new series again, just redoing it all, fresh, rich, now revelation to minister to you and bless you and build you. Amen? I thank you, thank you, thank you. And if God puts in your heart to be a partner with us, we need partners praying and standing in agreement with us for the impact, for the words. And I thank you if you consider being that, either officially or on. To be a financial partner because it takes finances, and I thank you for that as well. For more information, simply go to robertpairs.org and go to the partner page. And finally, if you don't have a local church and you're looking, you know, consider joining our online services right now so that you're always getting a now word, a right word, and getting built up. We need it right now in this last hour. We need to be receiving a good word that is as fresh bread presence, manna for today. Amen. For more information, go to robertpairs.org, go to the About page, um, and then go down to the church and you can sign up. I just want to remind you as always, as we just tell you that we love you, we're praying for you, and that this day, I don't care what it looks like, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because, through, and for Him. In the name, above all names, the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Thank you.